It's the weekend and you have financial questions that need answering. That can only mean one thing. It's time for Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome, welcome. It is the middle of April and it is unlike any time any of us has ever experienced. I think I can say that for all of us. It's just been incredible. It has been, um, I guess, about, I don't know, what do we say? Six weeks, Mark? About six weeks, seven weeks? It feels like forever. It feels like six years. How long has this really, this virus, pandemic, social distancing really been going on? I guess, I guess six weeks. Seems about right. Beginning of March-ish. And we're here to take the mystery out of your financial life because that's the only thing we can do. And I'm all into controlling what I can control. We are broadcasting from the Capital One Virtual Studios. Capital One, what's in your wallet? And, uh, you know, we're, we continue to field a ton of your questions, and we are here to help you out. In order to access us, all you need to do is send an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. And you know what's so cool? I keep thinking to myself that this time, which is so filled with uncertainty and anxiety, it's also a great time to really figure out what's going on in your own financial life. I keep saying this when I go on television, that this is a time to really go back to the basics. This is the time where you can start to say, well, you know what? I am paying some financial advisor, so-called advisor for help. What am I getting for that help? How am I managing this process? What is it that is um, that I'm missing? Maybe that's something that's important to you. Whatever is going on, what I want you to understand is that when you are in times of crisis, that is really where you see whether or not the system that you've created is one that will see you through. I mean, it's really easy to have a system that works when stock markets are rising, bond markets are pretty strong, the employment landscape is great. But what about, you know, when you're at extreme points in your life, that's when you find out what whether or not your system works. And that to me is very important. Okay. So let's start off with that. Understand whether or not the system is working or not. All right. We have a very long email and I'm going to actually read the whole thing because it's worthwhile. This is a good question. Tyler writes that he loves the show. And I'm reading, this is verbatim. Uh, I could post it, but I don't want his email to go live. He says, the straightforward advice is amazing and what a lot of people need right now. I hear a lot about retirement and what to do because of the market volatility, but I haven't heard much on what to do to get into the markets. I may have missed those segments since I usually listen to your podcast at work. Oh, he listens at work. Oh my gosh. As you'll see below, my wife and I are in a position to start investing now, but we're, we aren't making huge sums of money like other people I hear on your podcast. We've had a lot of change in the last six to 12 months. We're a bit lost on what to do next. Okay, well, let's, let's walk you through it. My wife is 26. I'm 27. We recently came into some money through an inheritance and we need to get some of it invested. We're sitting on $25,000, which we have reserved as our emergency fund. That would be six to eight months of expense. Great. Perfect. Okay. There's another $40,000 sitting in a savings account that earns next to nothing in interest while we decide what to do. Debts include, ready for this gang? $60,000 in student loans. Rates are 4% or lower. $182,000 home loan, 3.625%. Auto loan, $8,000, 2.99. We put down a full 20% down payment towards our home using some other inheritance money, which we bought in September 2019. No other debts. We also inherited a piece of farmland that was valued at $360,000 in 2017. Holy moly. 
We have been collecting some rent on that from a family member. It yields us about $6,500 a year after taxes. We know that much rent for that parcel is low, but it's difficult because it's a family member. All right, that's fine. We're working on a contract for deed for him to buy the land for us over the next five to 10 years. That's good. Okay. Now, he contributes 7% of his salary to a 401k. Company matches the full 7%. My wife also contributes the full match, has a state retirement plan. Our total yearly gross income, 80 to 85 grand for this year, potentially a little bit more on the land rent deal. Our incomes should not be affected by COVID-19. We don't expect any more cash inheritance. Right now, our cash flow doesn't allow for much extra contributions to savings considering our mortgage and student loan payments. Obviously, a higher land rent charge could change that. Okay. First, the, here's the question. Any, re, any advice on the land? Is selling a terrible idea? No, it's not a terrible idea. I mean, I know you'd rather have the cash. I just don't know whether, I don't know that market, and I feel like that's something you really need to talk to someone in your area who's like a real broker, because we don't know what, I have no idea, right? Um, next question. Um, researching index funds, doing a blend of domestic stock index, international and a bond index. That's perfect. Keep fees low. What options if we want to save for a big trip and might want to pull cash out with low fees? Index funds are a good way to start. Any relatively safe funds for emergency reserves? Should we use some of our cash to make extra contribution to a Roth? Is a target date fund through Vanguard good enough? How do we select a financial advisor? We want to avoid as many fees as possible. Okay, ready? Here's the answers. Um, number one, you don't need a financial advisor. So let's go in backwards. Number two, should you use some of your cash to make a contribution to a Roth IRA? Absolutely. I love that idea. So of the 40, each of you should put money into a Roth IRA. You can do that at Vanguard directly. No problem. Use a, um, use a target date fund. Perfect. Okay. So now we've burned up for, of your 40,000, we've burned up 12,000. All right. Now, what are you going to do with the rest? Well, I think that if you're really looking about for some money for um, to put money in cash, what I would do is go to depositaccounts.com. That's very important. Look for a longer term um, CD or potentially a higher yielding savings or money market account. And in terms of like what you do with the rest of the money, here's something to consider. I tell you what, I know it sounds crazy, but the $60,000 in student loans with rates of 4% or lower, yeah, I mean, it sounds like now, I think that since we are going to do the investing for the Roth, now might be a good time for you to start to whittle that down even more. So I would take the chunk of money that you're not using for your Roth, that you don't need for vacation, that you don't need for your emergency fund, and I would pay down the highest interest student loan debt. So 4% loans, why don't we get those paid off and go down the line. And that's it. No new investment fund for you because you are going to invest again through that Roth IRA contribution. But otherwise, let's get you a little bit better off um, in a balance sheet perspective. And then I think you will be in fantastic shape. Okay. Great question. Thanks for writing, Tyler. You are listening to Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, send us an email, askjill at jillonmoney.com. And during the break, hop onto our website, jillonmoney.com. There you can sign up for our free weekly newsletter. We'll be right back. Back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger helps you take the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's Jill on Money. And if you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. Our email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. And if you are poking around the website, the website's very easy, conveniently named Jill on Money, right? Jillonmoney.com. And if you're there, What's nice is that we have a very easy contact us button. It's in the upper right hand corner of the website. Uh, also, while you're there, maybe you might think about doing this. You can actually download 
all the cool stuff that we have done in the past. You can go to the watch button. You can go to the listen button. You can hear all the stuff that we've been playing with. Basically, we've been doing this for you know, since 2011, but we have a lot of stuff that's on there. And, you know, we're also doing something really different during this epidemic because so many of you have been asking questions and our email inbox has been bulging like nuts. What we've done is we've actually launched a daily broadcast. Now we always had a sister podcast called Jill on Money, but what we have now done is made that podcast a daily event. And you can download that podcast anywhere you get your favorite podcasts. It's called Jill on Money. We're calling it the Jill on Money Coronavirus Market Update. And you can get it on Apple or Stitcher or Radio.com, Google Play, anywhere you get your podcasts. If you're unfamiliar with podcasts, this is a great idea. During this crazy time, you can learn how to access podcasts. And so if you have an Android phone, you know, it's very easy to do. You actually have an app, right? Google Play. And if you have an Apple phone, you have an Apple podcast app and you can learn how to do this. It's really easy. It is radio that is on demand. And so I encourage you guys to do that. It it, Maybe we're answering some of the questions that you're thinking about right now on our daily podcast. So check it out. Jill on money. Rich writes that he's writing from Buffalo, New York. And he says, I've listened to you in the past and the most recent podcast, which he says gets him through the day because he says, I love your no bull advice. And it is in line with how I have managed my investments. My wife and I are both still working in essential state jobs. Good news. I love that. I'm 57, as is my wife. He started working in the public sector around 10 years ago after his former career was eliminated. Yikes. My wife lost her full-time job a few years back and works part-time by choice at a local state college. Our plan is to retire at age 62 with a $20,000 per year state retirement and jump into Social Security immediately, sell our house, and move south for some much-needed sunshine. Our combined income is right around $90,000. We've got a home worth $250,000 with no mortgage, with a lifestyle that allows for a comfortable existence while saving around 20% in our deferred compensation and cash. I had a 401k at a previous and, and a previous pension buyout. I transferred it to my state deferred compensation plan. Currently, as this writing, it's about $300,000, 50% in stocks. bonds, 20% stable income. My plan was to reallocate every March at five years to retirement, 10% out of stocks and into bonds at age 62 and only have 10% in stocks and the rest in bonds and stable income. My mantra all along is that you only have as much money in the plan as when you need to draw it out, meaning it's nice to feel you have $365,000 for retirement, but I've seen that vaporize in a matter of weeks to around 300,000. Stick to the goal, right? I plan to stand my ground, let the chips fall where they may, and I am going to stick to my original plan of attack. I could realistically squeak by on just pension and social security if need be, but to main our lifestyle, I need our deferred comp money to supplement our retirement income as planned. Another less attractive option is to work until age 65. Yuck. Does this sound like a good plan to you? Sending good vibes and hope from Buffalo. And then he has um, a great quote from Walt Disney. The way to get started is to quit talking and begin doing. Uh, Okay, Rich, I think the plan is great. Mostly I like that you have a plan. And so I know that I sound like a broken record with this, but having the plan is really the most important piece. I, I hear you about the 62. I wonder whether your plan looks a little bit better Um, just by delaying even a year or two. So I'm going to encourage you to access some of the retirement plan calculators that are online and just look at the difference of where you stand financially with an extra year or two of work. And the reason I think that's really important is that you may decide that it sounds like horrible to work till age 65, but maybe 63 and a half does look an awful lot better and gives you a little breathing room. And also, I guess the other piece of this is that 
uh, we want to make sure that as you consider moving and downsizing, um, that I would be careful to do a lot of research and try before you buy, meaning you should rent a little bit or spend a good chunk of time wherever you're going to end up going. Because Rich, in my experience, a lot of people make that decision and they regret it. They don't like where they've lived. They, they, where, they don't like where the place where they went to. And it's not because it wasn't a beautiful place. It's just that living it day to day is different than going there on vacation. So just be careful with that. But I love the game plan. I'm all in. Okay. All in. All right. Oh, Mark, you are right. These are some really long emails. So let's see. All right, let's do this one. I think this will maybe take us through the end of this segment. This is from Anthony. And he says, hi, Jill. I watch you every day. I hear you loud and clear. I have done everything correct. Oh, thank goodness. I don't have a lot of money. I put away $73,000 as of January of this year. It's not much. It's all I have. As of yesterday, um, this is the middle of March, that sum is down to about $63,000. My whole future is getting wiped out. I know you preach to wait it out. I might have a heart attack soon. I'm retired, 64 years old, and have minimum income from Social Security. I don't know what to do. So first of all, a month later, I wonder where Anthony stands. I'm presuming that um, the $10,000 loss that Anthony incurred is now a smaller amount. The second thing I want to point out is this. If you put away all this money and you put a chunk of it at risk, then we may have just learned an important lesson for you, Anthony. And that is that putting the money away was the, was really the hard part. Um, maybe the harder part is making sure that you have it invested in a way that is really in line with what your needs are. I think that we need to be very focused. And, and again, this is why a crisis, extreme events can put a huge Klieg light on your plans. How is that money invested what are you using that money for? How are you accessing that money? Do you need it to live on? Whatever amount you need to live on, you've got to make sure it's not at risk. So if you would like to follow up, Anthony, with an email just to get us a, a little bit more of the information we need to help you out, then indeed, we would love to help you. Okay? Um, all right. Now, let me see. Where where am I standing here? With one minute to go, I just want to say I got an email from a listener at WCBS Radio um, in New York City. And the listener email is, um, I heard Jill talk about small business owners having financial issues because of COVID. As a sole proprietor who has had to shut down my business, I'm trying to file for unemployment. Trying to file a claim has been impossible. I can't get through on the phone and the website won't connect. I wanted to let you know about the issue and ask you if you have any information that would be useful to file a claim. Okay, Harlan, let me just tell you this. It is uh, persistence. That's it. That's the only thing I can help you with. Many state unemployment systems under fire, under resourced, keep at it. It should get a little better and tell us how you do. All right, it's time for a break. It's Jill on Money. Send us your question. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, she's all over the place. Go to JillOnMoney.com to find it all. Now back to the show with Jill Schlesinger. You're back. It's Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. Our email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. That's askjill at jillonmoney.com. And if you're on the website, of course, don't hesitate to just use the contact button. It's up there in the right corner. Easy peasy. Get it? Got it? Good. 
All right. Uh, this is a nice long, uh, these are like, it's kind of fun, Mark, because I'm sort of like sinking into a long email. And I, I'm so delighted when we get a nice long email from someone who is a new listener. So here is the question from Emily, who writes, I'm a new listener and I'm loving, all caps, I'm loving your show. My husband and I are doing well financially. This is about to be a long and complicated email. Apologies in advance. Here are some of our financial stats. Okay, Emily's income, 120000 Emily's husband, 85000 Both of our jobs are secure during the COVID crisis, as far as we can tell. She's 29, he's 32. Planning for two children, hoping the first will come mid-next year. Once we have two kids, my husband is interested in staying home with them. This would probably only be until the older child goes to school. These are very well thought out plans, Emily, I'll tell you. Kids will probably be about two and a half to three years apart in age. Okay. And he would take off time if we go, say, two, th two to three years to go this path. Daycare in her area, not too expensive. It's more costly for him to take time off, but we want him to be able to stay home if that's what he wants. We have $25,000 in long-term savings in a high-yield money market account. Emily just got her bonus. She's looking at slowly putting $6,000 into the market over the course of the next few months. She gives me their holdings, and she's got like some index funds. She's got uh, an ETF, whatever. Okay. She was contributing 11% to her retirement. She just up upped it to 16%. Her husband is contributing 10 plus a 5% match. He got started a little late in the game with retirement due to student loans and due to coming from a lower family income. She says, I was lucky. Emily, remember what my mother says, rich or poor, it's nice to have money. Their current balance is 30,000 in his 401k, 20 in her current 401k. It's mostly Roth, 30 grand in a 401k from a previous employer. She also has a Roth IRA at Vanguard with about 18 grand. Um, and her contributions in her current 401k are almost all Roth. Husband's Roth contributions um, are non-Roth. They bought a house last summer, 485 grand. They've got an outstanding loan on the house for 431,000. Ah, they put down 10%. Monthly mortgage, 2560, we pay 2800. Our interest, 3.785%. One of our cars is paid off. The other car they just bought, they've got $21,000 at a 3.9% auto loan rate. Husband has a student loan, 45 grand. Uh, they just refinanced, new interest rate, 4.56. We make enough to take home about $9,500 per month after taxes, retirement contributions, and health care. When all is said and done, we generally have about $2,000 that we put into the money market. We're both white-collar knowledge economy workers. Our long-term job prospects are good. She, blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, I won't do too much detail. Okay, thoughts on her Fidelity brokerage account uh, holdings. I want to see this money grow, and potentially cash out. Uh, partially in five to 10 years for a boat. What? Just buy three index funds and stop messing around. So just buy, you got SPY, which is the S&P 500 ETF, then do a bond fund and then do an international fund and make them as cheap as possible. So that's it. Don't, don't have to pick and choose too much. Your old 401k, you can roll it over for sure. Um, whether or not you should do a Roth conversion, I'm not, I, I don't think you should right now. I think if you were going to do a Roth conversion, I would wait until your husband is taking time off and then your tax bracket will drop. Okay. Now she says, my husband and I have different ways to think about debt. Uh, he wants to, um, so when we get a big chunk of change, like a bonus, he wants to dump it into the car or the house or the loans to get them pa paid off faster. I'm more inclined to save or put it in the market. What do you think? I think that if you're, I think you can do a little bit of everything, but do not pay off this house. That's not what you should do at all. In fact, whatever money you have left over, you can pay off the student loan at 4.56%. That's what I would do. I'd focus on that. That's a high rate of interest, relatively speaking, to everything else. It's risk-free. You'll make that. So pay that down first. And then um, when you look at the car, you know, 3.9% for a asset like is losing value every single day, I'd pay that off next. Okay. So I'm more inclined to be with him. You guys are putting money into the market, which is great because you're putting into retirement accounts. So I would keep doing that. 
the boat, I don't even know what to say about boats. They're the worst investment in the world. So if like, if you want to throw away money, that's fine. Uh, so she wants to know, should we put more money in the money market versus the high interest account? Nah, it's all the same. It doesn't matter. That's fine. Mark, is 25 grand a little light for them in terms of emergency reserve, you think? Yeah, I think that I'm going to re let me just retool this. I think that number one is I want to make sure that the money you have in that safe asset account is not, in, you say you have 25,000 is good for three to six months. I think that, that you want to really have six to 12 months in there. That's what I would do. So if you have to, so the first thing is that of the $2,000 a month, half goes into that account to build it up. So it's six to 12 months and the other half goes to paying down the student loan uh, debt. That's it. Once your emergency reserve is then retooled and up to the snuff, all of the money goes to pay down the student loan debt. Once the student loan debt is done, then it's the car loan. And then at the time where the car loan, where you're really focusing on the car loan, you could sort of take half of the money and put it on the car loan, half the money you can increase your retirement contributions. That's it. And you should not pay down your mortgage. There's no, there's absolutely no way to justify doing that. So don't pay down that mortgage. Do pay down those other debts. Okay. That was a long question. I hope you understood it. For everyone listening... You know what? When you give me all that information, I can give you a very detailed response. So thanks so much for your email, Emily, and uh, let us know how that goes. See if you have any follow-up questions. It's Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, send an email, ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. And don't forget to go to the website, jillonmoney.com. You can sign up for our free weekly newsletter. We'll be right back. Do I invest here? Should I put my money there? Jill Schlesinger can help you. Back to Jill on Money. You're back. It's Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, we are here to help you out. I know these are very difficult times, but, you know, if, if at all possible, let's direct your anxiety in the proper way. So if you've got financial anxiety, let us help you out. If you're really focusing on your finances because you're really scared about your health, that's something different. But let's kind of unravel those pieces and help you remain as sane as possible. The way to get in touch with us is simple. Send us an email. Our email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. And you'll notice we haven't been doing as many phone call phone conversations because Mark and I are both working remotely. And so bringing an extra person into the conversation is possible, but it's not easy. So um, when we get back into our groove, maybe we'll um, start weaving in some more of your questions via phone. But for now, you'll have to hear me actually talk to you in this way. Cliff writes, he says, writing you from our home, chugging emergencies. I hope you and Mark are staying healthy. We are. Thank you. Um, I have that emergency. I think that's baloney, by the way, but I always take it when I don't feel well. Um, Cliff says, my wife and I love your show. We wrote you earlier this year regarding a backdoor IRA and appreciated your input. Our question is focused on how we can take advantage of the big swings that are occurring in the market. My wife and I are in our early 30s. We're in an upper middle class income. We live in the greater Boston area. Assets, $400,000 in a 401k IRA, maxing out our contributions, 70 stock, 30 bond. Okay. House is worth $650,000. They've got $110,000 in equity. They've got a... Um, Let's see, their interest rate is 3.85%. 80,000 bucks in emergency reserve, 60,000 in a brokerage account, conservative, 70 bomb, 30 stock. Um, we invest about $1,000 a month in it. $10,000 previous company stock, recently halved, as in half in the recent stock market crash, no other debts. Okay, question one. I'm not a financial guy. 
We're in the biotech business. We'd love some recommendations on books to read that can help intelligently become a more active investor. I read The Intelligent Investor, which I thought was a great introduction. I'm looking for a book that can help me understand performance of stock to evaluate if a company is over or undervalued. Does anything come to mind? You know what comes to mind to me? That that's a sucker bet. So go buy my book, which is called The Dumb Things Smart People Do With Their Money, and you are exactly the person I write about. You're a really smart person, and you think you're going to be able to um, pick and choose which are the best companies and what's undervalued and overvalued. And if I could just remind everybody that you know there are professions that are built on trying to identify undervalued and overvalued companies, and they consistently fail to beat the indexes against which they are measured. So anything come to mind? No. Um, buy my book. Let me give you one other book to read. Go out and buy Reminiscence of a Stock Operator. It's a 1923 book, and it will tell you everything you need to know about why this is a silly idea on your part. Okay? Sorry. Tough love. Number two, the brokerage account. $60,000 saved up in conservative allocation, waiting for this market swing. I know, I know you were going to say this is market timing. I felt the market was overvalued, blah, blah, blah. We invest this much money. Okay. And then they were, so how would you invest the account? First of all, I'm laughing my ass off right now because you were waiting and waiting and waiting. Now it's here for you and you, you won't pull the trigger. Put all your money into, and just go out and figure out what portion you want to have in cash, stock, and bond, and then go find index funds that actually will fulfill your allocation and you can put the money that's there. You can allocate it right away. If you feel like you want a dollar cost average, that's fine, but you've been waiting for this and now you have not, now you're unwilling to pull the trigger. So let's get going, Cliff, move it. And yes, the thousand dollars a month should be invested as such, but don't mess around with this allocation. That to me is like where you're going to run into a problem. I, I fear that what's going to happen for you is that you're going to be in this place and you're going to think you've timed the market perfectly. And then you're going to move your allocation, pick an allocation you can live with. Question, during bear markets, are there sectors that you can focus on to help improve returns? Healthcare, real estate, energy? No. There, every every bear market and every recession is different. So No. And at what point would you feel comfortable investing a portion of the safety net? And if so, how much? Well, for the safety net, no, I don't put any money in the safety. Anything that is your safety net, then you it, it remains as a safety net. Anything that is available for your brokerage account, that's your brokerage account. That's it. And you know what, Cliff, I, I, I get the sense, I'm getting frustrated and I don't want to hear, I, I don't want you to hear... Um, the frustration in a way that's like mean to you. What I'm frustrated is that you have now been lucky enough to make one half of a decision around market timing. You're lucky enough that you can actually say, oh my God, I'm so lucky I have the money available to do this. And what is frustrating to me is that you have now sort of trumped your luck. And now you think you're going to be a genius about timing the market. So let's get the money working for you. Let's go and try to make some hay with that luck that you have found. So anyway, good luck to you. Good continued luck to you. All right. And if you want to talk more about stock picking, just, you know what, Google stock picking and Jason Zweig and see what happens. You'll see there's just not a lot of evidence that picking stocks is A, um, preferable to index funds, and it actually may find you making less money over time. Okay. It's Jill on money. If you've got a market timing question, just remember, Aunt Jill's not going to sugarcoat it. I'm here for you, man, but I'm going to give you the unvarnished truth. Send an email, ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. You're back. It's Jill on money. If you've got a financial question, concern, maybe it's a question about economics. Maybe it's a question about all the different stuff swirling around in the ether right now. We are your one-stop shop. We're like the, the question and answer king and queen. That is me, 
Jill Schlesinger, Mark, the best executive producer in the world. And we are broadcasting from the Capital One Remote Virtual Studios. Capital One, what's in your wallet? Um, hey, uh, I, I understand from the Treasury Department because I get their uh, their emails, 80,000 Americans should be getting their stimulus checks or should have gotten them this week. If you don't need your stimulus check, if you don't need this, if for some reason you are very financially secure, I would really encourage you to give a portion of it away. Feedingamerica.org is fantastic. It'll allow you to find a food bank and uh, really covers most of the food banks in the nation. So check that out, feedingamerica.org. That's the website address. So if you don't need the money, then, you know, someone else really does. I want to just remind everybody of that. These are such tough times. So let's, I know we talk about your money all the time. I also want to make sure that we talk about other people and what you can do to help them out. Okay, Steve writes the subject line, mortgage payoff with three exclamation points. In one of your segments on CBSN, so CBSN is our streaming network at CBS, I heard you state that paying down your mortgage was a viable alternative to slumping interest and or money market rates. This is true because I said to people, you know, if you've got a lot of money and it's sitting in a money market account and you really do want to have security, then sometimes I don't usually talk about paying down mortgages, but if you've got a four, five, six percent mortgage and you're using money that's earning less than a half of a percentage point to pay that down, that's an arbitrage, ladies and gentlemen. That is being really smart. So check it out. Steve says he had a secured 6.38% fixed 30-year mortgage back from 2001. He says, I am proud to say that because of your advice, he's now debt free. Oh my God. All right. Well, that's a good way to end a segment. So congratulations. If you've got a financial question, send us an email. And even if you want to boast about something, that's great too. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. It's the weekend and that can only mean one thing. You're listening to Jill on Money the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome, welcome. It's our number two of the Jill on Money show. And this is, uh, oh boy, it is a rough time for us all. I, I completely know these are strange, strange times. Uh, you know it's a strange time because we're broadcasting not from our normal studio, but Mark and I are in two different locations. We are broadcasting from the Policy Genius Virtual Studios. Policy Genius is the easy way to compare and buy insurance. Just go to policygenius.com. You know, we thought it would be interesting to resurrect a great interview that we did with a guy named Chris Gillibo. He is Mr. Side Hustle. He wrote the book called Side Hustle. And we wanted to bring him on because we thought that a lot of the advice that he had would be relevant for the millions of people who are either already laid off, furloughed, um, maybe completely downsized or just worried and why we think having a side hustle is so important. And this is, again, we recorded this interview a while back, but we're resurrecting the interview because we think it could really help a lot of you. So here is the first part of our interview with Chris Gillibo. What's the best financial decision you've ever made? I invested my money in going to every country in the world. When did you do that? Yeah. Well, not all of my money, but like I chose to prioritize, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it was an 11 year project. So it wasn't like one decision. That's just the first thing that came to me when you asked that question. Like I, I chose to value experiences more than like, you know, buying a $30,000 car like my friends were doing at the time. Let's go back a second. So you're here today because we are going to hustle up some action for Side Hustle, your book, from idea to income in 27 days. And we're going to talk about the side hustle, but let's talk about you for a second. Sure. So give us a, a quick thumbnail of the story of your life, including why you started this project over 11 years of seeing every single country in the world. Absolutely. So quick little thumbnail. Um, was a juvenile delinquent. Uh, Hold it. Stop. High school dropout. Hold on. Juvenile well, delinquent. There was more to it, but that's what. Uh, <laughs> what did you delink? What did I delink? Um, I stole two cars. 
I wasn't a very good car thief because I got caught both times, basically. Did you go to jail? I did. Well, to like juvenile detention center. Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah. Oh, your poor parents. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they were actually good to me. It wasn't their fault. You know, I mean, I wish <laughs> at the time I blamed them. You know, at the time it was like, oh, my parents are terrible and that's why I messed up. But it was really just me. Okay. Yeah. So you got uh, caught twice. So yeah. not, car thief, not a good uh, job not for you. Not good at it, right? Um, that's a problem with that job. You don't really improve over time because, you know, <laughs> the, 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 the stakes are so high. Anyway, um, um, I discovered pretty early on, not just because of the juvenile delinquent thing, but uh, I was essentially unemployable, like not really great at working for other people. Um, Why? Are you a difficult person? You seem very nice. Well, I mean, I, I, I guess I, I learned I was motivated. I actually liked to work. Actually, I was really excited when I found something I believed in, but if I didn't believe in it, it was hard for me. Mm. Like I had ADD, you know, I had, had some other like childhood issues that not related to the juvenile delinquency. Mm. But when I was 19, uh, I discovered micro entrepreneurship, which I guess I call a side hustle now. And, uh, Micro entrepreneurship sounds like an annoying term that like it? some yeah. idiot. Well, I guess what in, I mean, in, like, is I'm not. I wasn't like trying to start a business, right? right I was trying like, to. Work. I was trying to work for myself, okay. basically. So I mean, the story was like this is 20 years ago. New website had just come out called eBay.com. I've heard of that. Yeah, some people have. Oh, interesting. And, uh, you know, at the time I was working at FedEx in Memphis, Tennessee, in like the middle of the night, like loading boxes on a truck, and I got paid eight dollars an hour to do that. Mm. So eBay.com, I discovered I could sell stuff, and I made like sixteen dollars an hour the first time I tried it, and I didn't know anything about what I was doing. I wasn't what a were good you copywriter. selling? Well, I started by selling stuff from around my apartment, you know, and that was great until I ran out of stuff to sell. But <laughs> it was a good little entry point. It was my gateway. Well, like, give me an example of something you sold in your apartment. Oh, random stuff, video games, you know, video games, clothes. Um, I had like Lego sets, you know, from when I was a kid. Sold those, you know. And then uh, in the early days of eBay, this is a little fun fact, um, it was totally a seller's market because it was so new. Everybody's like, wow, this auction site. You could literally like go to the store and buy something and sell it on eBay and people would pay more for it because it was like that. on the internet. Right, you know? right. So that didn't last, of course, but uh, it was, for me, it was the, the thrill of it, the attraction of it, the idea that like I'm making this for myself and if I get better at copywriting, then I can probably sell more. And if I start looking at the completed auctions and see like what's being sold and at what price, and then I try to track it back and see, okay, where's the distributor? I, I really, really like that. Actually, kind of fell into that. So to fast forward a bit, I did stuff like that um, in a variety of ways for um, just about eight years. And as part of that time, I lived overseas in West Africa as an aid worker. Really? And my side hustles allowed me to do that, basically. And I had a you know, great experience there, transformative, life-changing, all that kind of stuff. And uh, eventually came back to the U.S. Uh, and started a new career, a new project of going to every country in the world. When you were in West Africa, and I mean, that's obviously pretty intense. Mm -hmm. uh, was it fun for you? Was it hard for you? W w give, give me like a description yeah. of like, like how long were you there? Four years. Wow. Four years, 2002 to 2006. Uh, I don't know if fun is the word, uh, but I loved it. Rewarding. Yeah, rewarding. It was incredible. Like I was just working in logistics. Like I had no real skills, you know. I had a degree in sociology by that point, but that also means you're unemployable, you know, which is convenient, you know, given my personality. <laughs> but I was doing logistics. I ended up actually like representing the organization to the host governments we were working with. And so I ended up with all these responsibilities uh, at a young age, which was good. And I had this little office and the doctors on the ship were doing cataract surgery, among other things things and I could see like an old man who's like you know 70 years old like walk down the hallway from my office and like he's on somebody's arm because he can't see a few hours later he like walks back on his own and he can see it's amazing so I'm like this is like most of the time with charity stuff you don't really get to see the direct results mm -hmm. of what you're doing but I could like load up medical supplies in my Land Rover and drive like six hours into the hinterland and deliver them to a clinic that had nothing and so it was like I said, fun is not the word, but it was it was amazing, and I feel very grateful for that experience. So when you decided you were going to start to go to every, I mean, you might mm. have said like, "Let me do every continent." Sure. Right, because that would have been a little bit easier on yourself. Yeah. Do, you, so, do you like to make lists? Are you a list maker? Uh, I am. Okay. Um, but I'm just thinking that like every country feels daunting. But but you, how did you feel when you did that? Okay. Was that like well, exciting? Well, yeah. So I'm, I'm glad you used that word, daunting, because. I didn't begin with that vision to go to every country when I had been to like three countries. You know, I, I had this experience of being in West Africa, and those are some challenging countries to kind of travel in just logistically. And I was a list maker, and so I was always making lists of my to dos and my tasks, my ideas, my business ideas, my life ideas, whatever. And so I had a list of the countries I'd been to. One time I was traveling in, in Eastern Europe, I had a train. This is like, you know, before cell phones were, were ubiquitous, and so I didn't have internet. So I made a list of all the countries, it's like 30 countries I'd been to. And I was like, I want to set a goal to go to 100, because I was always big on goal setting too. So travel, love of travel, love of lists, goal setting, going to go to 100 countries. As I got closer to achieving that goal, 
at first it was like 100 countries sometime in my life, you know, right. no deadline. Yeah. But then I realized it's actually not that hard to do. Real? Well, no, I, mean, I mean, there's a lot of small countries, a lot of small countries in, in Eastern in, in, Europe. In Europe, you know, in the Caribbean, even in Southeast Asia, it's not hard to get, you know, so it's like the real challenge is, you know, to basically double up and to go, it's not just twice as many, it's that there's no exception to it. Because with 100, if you, if you run into a difficulty somewhere, you just go somewhere else. How many hmm. are there? 193. Total? There's 193 mm -hmm. countries in the world, yeah. and you had already done 100 by what in your 20s, 30s? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I began officially began the quest around like country number 70. The first half of it was completely private. I think that's important to mention. Like, I didn't have any public profile. I wasn't writing about it. There was no business model. I didn't even have a Facebook profile. Like, it was just my personal thing. Like, I really love the idea of it. Right. But then things kind of changed about halfway through uh, when I started a blog, The Art of Nonconformity. That was initially to chronicle that journey. I'm like, hey, everybody, I'm going to go to every country in the world. going to set a deadline by my 35th birthday. I thought that was important. Like every good goal has a deadline. And I'm going to start sharing about it. So I started sharing about the journey. And that just that led to so many other things that I had no idea. We'll get back to our interview with Chris Gillibo in just a moment. When we return, of course. But during the break, why don't you go to the website, jillonmoney.com. There you can read, listen, watch, and check out our resource section. We are updating the resource section with tons of information about various programs around coronavirus. So check it out, jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. Back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger helps you take the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's Jill on Money. And this is the program that attempts to give you a little bit of financial advice during a very trying time. If you've got a financial question, give us a shout. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. If you're just joining us, we are replaying an interview that we did with Chris Gillibo, author of Side Hustle. And uh, in this segment, we thought it was just going to be important to help you figure out how you can develop your own side hustle. And I think more than ever, this is great advice for all of us to have something on the side. Here's more of our interview with Chris Gillibo. Why did you write this book, Side Hustle? So I learned over time, not everybody is like me, right? Not everybody is unemployable. Well, not um, everybody is a failed car thief. Well, that too. Think also, about that. But that's the next book, you mm -hmm. know. This is, uh, so last year I had another book out. I did a tour to 30 cities. It was really interesting because I had this whole message about like how to find the work you were born to do. And um, I noticed that people responded disproportionately to this whole part of having a side hustle. I talked about that for like one minute of my 30 minute stump speech. It's the only thing people cared about. Really? 50% like of the questions afterwards were like, wait a minute, can you tell me more about that? And interesting. You know, I've been writing about this side hustles, you know, for eight years in different ways. But I do feel like there's just this renewed interest in it. And, and so I really was like, I do a lot of different stuff. I'm kind of all over the map. I have ADD. But uh, I wanted to focus on this. And so I was like, this year, I'm going to write the Side Hustle book. I'm going to do a 100-city tour. I have a podcast, you know, where every single day Plug I'm it. telling a story. Sure, it's called Side Hustle School. Seven days a week, nice. 10 minutes a day. I love this book. Okay, I'm reading this. Dude, look at the amount of, like, page you that I You actually have read this book. Uh -huh, That's very impressive. Uh-huh. And look wow. at this. Like, I'm circling things. A lot of hosts things. don't read the book, so also thank you. First of all, the reason why I like it is that I can completely relate to this idea of mm. like, I kind of love the idea of us. I mean, I am evidence of this, right? Mm. So I have like sort of a main job and a bunch of side hustles. Great. And so what I also really enjoyed was the fact that you didn't put the pressure on to make this like you have to be an entrepreneur and yep. develop your Harvard Business School plan right, and right. go get venture funding and da-da-da. Yeah. Like, that's so much pressure. In fact, you probably shouldn't, actually. Right? Right. It's more than just you don't have to do that, and you probably shouldn't do that. And, so, yeah. and, and in this economy, which is is strange right now because it's sort of sort of strong, but not yeah. really. It's a strange economy. Like the stock market's going up, but yet people have still feel all this anxiety and uncertainty. And the the, the job market is not strong. Like regardless of, of numbers, it's really interesting because people feel, feel a lack of security. And so what can a side hustle do to relieve that anxiety, do you think? Yeah. So I don't think I gave you a, a good answer before. I didn't give you a complete answer of like why I did this. You know, this book is not for entrepreneurs. This book is for people out there who have day jobs and are busy and they don't have a lot of time, but they love the idea of investing in themselves somehow. Maybe that's why they're listening to the show right now. And what they need is a blueprint, right? They need to know like step by step, how do I actually do this? Because maybe I tried it before and I failed. Uh, or maybe I'm like on the outside looking in, see other people that are doing this. Um, 
But, you know, what should I do? Should I go and participate in the gig economy? Like, absolutely not, in my opinion. But we can we can come to that. Like, you, okay. should, you should create an asset for yourself, which is what this, this book is about. What a side hustle can do is, you know, first of all, extra money. That's great. Let's Love just start it. with that, right? But also confidence, security, empowerment, uh, the sense of being able to look at something and say, I made this thing. And I've got a job. Maybe I like my job. That's great. Maybe I don't like my job, but that's that's what it is for now. You know, I need that for my mortgage, you know, et cetera. I've got this other thing that I am cultivating on my own, and I look forward to it. And when I get the PayPal notification that somebody has sent me money, it just feels really good. So it's a backup plan, more options. Ultimately, it's about more freedom. And, you know, I love the idea of freedom because so often, you know, we do calls on this show. So people will call in and we'll talk about this. And I always say, like, well, you know, if you just do this, you'll have more freedom or you'll have opportunity. And I think that that's the part of the side hustle mm-hmm. that's so appealing to me in that, yes, you know, you can make a great living working for a company. There's awesome benefits. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm the first one to remind everyone, like, don't just walk away from your job because right, there's right. like some great stuff you're getting. Right. But also a sense of control. Mm-hmm. Um, it was interesting. Um, we recently interviewed Tim Harford from the Financial yeah, Times. Yeah, right. And um, I was asking him about. You know, how did he start writing books? Because he's so incredibly prolific. Mm-hmm. He goes, you know, I had a job and I really liked it. It was fine. He goes, but on the side, I was writing this book called The Undercover Economist. Yep, right. It was so, it was like so pleasurable. Mm-hmm. And he goes, you know, when I had a crappy day at work, not that that was every day, but that if I had a crappy day, I could go home and I could write 500 words. And exactly what you said, mm-hmm. feel like I had done something yep. mm-hmm. for me. Yep. And he didn't even think about monetizing it. Right. He just was doing it because he mm-hmm. needed an outlet. Right. And I think that's also a piece of this that's yeah, really a important. creative outlet, doing something that's different apart from your from your day job, for sure. So you made a little, took a shot at the gig economy. Sure. So what's the difference between being part of the gig economy mm-hmm. versus exploring a side hustle? Right. So, I mean, first things I think... The side hustle phrase is kind of, you know, ubiquitous in the culture and people are talking about it all the time, but they have different definitions about it. So some people might talk about the gig economy as like, this is my side hustle. Um, I think the problem with with that is driving for Uber, driving for Lyft, something like that, TaskRabbit, you know, Airbnb, all that kind of stuff. It's like a part-time job. Nothing wrong with having a part-time job. Like we've all done that in our lives at different points. But all those things that we just talked about, security, backup plan, freedom, none of those things really exist there. With Uber, you can set your own schedule. Good benefit. It is good. Yeah. But your income is capped. You know, there's competition. Uh, You're relying entirely on their platform, their ecosystem. They can take that away at any time. Mm. Whereas with something that you're creating for yourself, like the income is unlimited. You can go in lots of different directions. You can do all kinds of different things. There's just so much more creativity as well, to, to your point. So that's, my, that's my, my kind of beef about that. I don't think it's terrible. I just think people shouldn't think of it as being an entrepreneur, which is kind of how Uber pitches it. Uber is like, this is going to be like your gateway to freedom. And not really. You're just right. driving people around. You're performing a service. Nothing wrong with that, as I said. But it's not what I'm trying to help people do. So what also interested me is that in reading the book, and you tell all these really wonderful stories, that it seemed that there were a lot of times where people were doing something at work. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, I'm doing something that seems valuable to others Mm -hmm. in my workplace. And that was the germ of the idea of the side Mm -hmm. hustle. So can you talk a little bit about that, some of those stories? Like, you know, I was thinking about, that was teaching people how to use software. Oh, the database Uh, guy. Yeah, right, the database guy. Yeah, he's he's a database administrator. Actually, I just met him last week in Colorado at the book event. Awesome. I did. His name is Dan, and he he works for a hospital. He's a database administrator. And uh, his first side hustle was uh, tutoring people who need, need help with a specific software, Microsoft Access. And that was great. He was making like 60 to $80 an hour, you know, doing tutoring. But then he learned of a second need through that process. Uh, some people actually, you know, were connected to companies or organizations that needed custom jobs, essentially. So part of the, the whole fun thing about a side hustle is sometimes it can lead you to something even greater than what you initially imagined, mm-hmm. you know. Tutoring, it's it's great, you know, but it's it's not that original of an idea, right? But he followed that, and then that led him to something greater where he actually is creating more of an asset. I worked with a guy at CBS, and mm-hmm. early on, he was clearly like the only human being at CBS News who knew about social media. Mm-hmm. Right. He really was. He was like, and this yeah. was not that long ago, right. so the, <laughs> not don't, too, don't... Not too shocked. Right, exactly. I'm outing myself and the organization. <laughs> Sorry. So I, I pulled him aside, and I'm like, dude, can you, like, hook me up? Mm-hmm. Like... I'll pay you. Right. He's like, what do you mean pay me? 
Right. And I'm like, because you have this knowledge. Right. Valuable skill, valuable knowledge that's in demand. People want to know. Right. right. Old farts like me (laughs) need this. Come do it. And so he was like, I can't take money. Well, I plied him with vodka, so that was good. So okay, for you gave a while, him something, I some gave, compensation. Yeah, but then right. he started to take money. It was fine. Good for him. Good. But meanwhile, he's like our he's like our secret weapon. Yeah. Like Mark exactly. and I use him. Like we're taking him out to dinner, and I'll yeah. give him some money on the side. Like help me do this and that. Right, and like right. so now he's left CBS, but mm. he is more interested in sort of saying like maybe that should be my side yeah. hustle. Well, good for him, and and good point as well. Like uh, a big thing of what I'm trying to show people is to use the skills you already have. Right. Don't necessarily go out and don't learn to make an app. Don't learn to code if that's not your thing. Everybody wants to make an app. You know, how do I make an app? I'm like, are you a developer? Nope. Do you know how to write code? Nope. Well, don't do that. Right. Like, <laughs> let's start with the skills you have. The whole program here is like idea to income in 27 days. We'll get back with more of our interview with Chris Gillibo. The book is called Side Hustle. Check it out. There's also many permutations of it that he has done. When we return, we will get back to that. If you've got a financial question during the break, just send us an email. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, she's all over the place. Go to JillOnMoney.com to find it all. Now back to the show with Jill Schlesinger. You're back. It's Jill on Money. If you've got a question about your financial life, we'd love to hear from you. It's askjill at jillonmoney.com. You know, this past week, we had the International Monetary Fund predicting that there would be a global recession, which would be the worst since the Great Depression. Big downturn. So what are you going to do to prepare for this next period of time? Maybe you should be developing your side hustle. That's why we are rebroadcasting an interview that we did a few years back with Chris Gillibo. He is the father of the side hustle movement, and his advice is so valuable. So here's more of our interview with Chris Gillibo. So what if... Someone's listening and they're like, I want a side hustle. I love this guy. Chris is the man. Great. I have no ideas. You have a smattering of ideas, which Mm -hmm. I love because it sort of gives, it takes people off the hook. Like, I'm not creative. Help me. Yep. Give me some of those ideas. Well, people have one of two problems. The first problem is what you just identified. I don't have an idea. Second problem is I've got an idea, but I don't know what to do next, right? So what I'm trying to do with with the book and the whole plan is show people the answers to both those problems. So I can give people ideas, and in, and in fact I do. Like there's you know 48 ideas you can steal, beg, borrow, or steal, you know, from from the book. But what I think is more valuable is to actually show people where ideas come from. Like where where do side hustle ideas come from that are good ideas that are viable or valuable? If you can acquire this skill, which you, you probably didn't learn in school, but is not that difficult to learn. Um, it can serve you for the rest of your life. So I think that's the most valuable thing. Can I give some of the side hustles that are fun, which I love? Sell your art crafts or any handcrafted item on Etsy. Easy. Easy, right? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't require much expertise to list it. If you've never used that website, you can register today and put something up. I like offer online tutoring services in your field of expertise. Everybody does have a field of expertise. Right. They don't, I think that a lot of people discount the, the expertise they have. Yeah, I say everyone's an expert at something. Yeah, right? it may not be interesting to anyone else, but you know, no, <laughs> right, I'm just right. kidding. And so on that point, like people think tutoring, okay, that sounds great, where do I do it? Well, there are platforms, there are sites, there are networks that you can do all these things. There's a whole list of them, go on. I like buy and sell used textbooks to college students. Those they still expensive. need those? Those are expensive. They Apparently st- they do. Apparently they do still read in college. I like this one. Create and sell a visitor's guide to your town or city or build a web resource for tourists mm-hmm. supported by advertisers. Mm-hmm. Yep. No, I love people that. Have done that. Yeah, I sure. love that one. All right. Here's one. Start a podcast and sell sponsorship. All right. That's harder. I mean, it's a little bit. Know. No, I think that I think starting any, you know, any yeah. knucklehead. Look at us. We're two yeah, knuckleheads. We, do this, we have a know, we have podcasts, exactly. right? Yeah. Do you have sponsors? I do. Yeah, me too. I don't know how it happened. But, so, but I but, you know, the funny thing is, I feel like. That one part of the side hustle that 
you don't necessarily really talk about in like an explicit way, but is really important no matter what, is that you do have to sell your idea. Sure. That can mean you have to sell it to people who want it. Mm -hmm. So I think you cover that. But to monetize it, you may have to actually sell. And I think so many people are really uncomfortable with that. So how do we get them over that? Well, I have this model called sell like a Girl Scout. Okay. What I mean by this is I live in Portland, Oregon. You've been to Portland, you said. I love it. Yeah. It's probably like this in, in New York too, although I, for some reason I see it more there. Like you walk down the street and pretty much everywhere you go, you're kind of accosted by these street canvassers. They're trying to raise money for their cause and often they're representing very good causes. Yeah. But I hate this process. Hate it. I, it's, I feel like it's manipulative. I feel like it's it's marketing by guilt. And they know it too. Like they, That's why they have to like call, you know, they have to like give you a big smile and like, you're looking great today. I'm like, yeah, I know you just want my money basically. So anyway, I hate that process. By the way, you look great today. Thank you. I do. <laughs> <laughs> I learned to never ask questions when someone compliments you. You know, you just go with it. There's a whole story about that we could get to later if you want. Anyway, street canvassers. Um, meanwhile, you know, every Girl Scout cookie season, Girl Scouts are setting up shop, little table in front of the drugstore. Mm-hmm. People are walking by. Their whole pitch is, would you like to buy some Girl Scout cookies? Right. That's it. I mean, like, it's not much to it. You right. Know? And what happens? You buy them. Everybody buys They're them. They're so cute, though, those girls. Yeah. You think it's the prop? I think it's the cookies, to be honest. I mean, maybe the, the cookies girls. are good. Yeah. So the whole goal is like, how can you put yourself in a position of marketing like a Girl Scout instead mm. of a street canvasser? Yeah. Because they're both selling, but right. one of them is kind of icky. Yeah. And one of them is kind of awesome. So, how do you do it? So you make something that you make something that people want, and you find those those people, and you, you find know? where they are. Yeah. Exactly. Right. And so you, you know, I have this this lesson about take your take your customer, your imaginary customer, to imaginary coffee, and you really figure out who these people are. And it's not so much about a target market. I don't like that. I feel like that's a very startup-y kind of thing. And, you know, like when I started my blog, like I remember this like eight years ago, I would talk to publishers, like, who's your target market? And they want me to say like women age 35 to 39, mm. you know, with a college degree or whatever. And I would say my target market is people who want to change the world. And they're like, that's not a target market, you know? Really? It's like a psychographic, you know? Uh-huh. But anyway, so focusing on finding those people who can really, really benefit from what you have to offer. And then it's like you're a Girl Scout, right? You're like, I've got this thing. You know what's funny? Mark and I were at a meeting recently, and we were talking with uh, a big company, like a potential sponsor. Sure. And they were saying, what's the secret sauce of a successful <laughs> podcast? Yeah. Which is awesome. I, I mean, everybody wants to know that. Yeah. And Mark's sort of like, well... You have to have good content, you know, because we're old time radio people, right? right? So right. we like spoken word. You actually we were, like quality. It's right. A strange thing. Hence, yeah. hence, we're in like a big studio wow. in a big broadcast center, mm-hmm. right? We're not in some tinny computerized. Yeah, you do thing. this thing called editing. Right. You know, like you do preparation. These yes. Kind of new concepts. So we talked about that. And then I said, you know, and you have to have a compelling guest. Sometimes your audience doesn't know that they're interested in Chris. Mm hmm. What's fascinating is that that seemed like they were like, mm, yes, mm-hmm. that's so interesting. That's so funny. Right? Yeah. But that's really, sometimes the simplest sure, sure. answer is mystifying to people. Right, right. It's like asking what's the secret sauce to anything, pretty much. It's like, well, you, you work hard, you do a good job, you improve along the way, you figure out what people want and you give it to them. Right. And I think also you listen to them because mm-hmm. it sounds to mm-hmm. me like because you have such great interaction with your audience mm-hmm. and with the people you've talked to about side hustles, you have a lot of feedback. Yep. So it's like you're developing your own algorithm. Like, yeah. I now know All how to do this. All my work has been informed by my community, like one way or another. We'll get back to our interview with Chris Gillibo, father of Side Hustle, in just a minute. If you've got a financial question, you can always send us an email, askjill at jillonmoney.com. And you can also follow us on social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. We've got a YouTube channel at Jill on Money. Check it out. We'll be right back. Do I invest here? Should I put my money there? Jill Schlesinger can help you. Back to Jill on Money. 
You're back. It's Jill on Money. It's the program that is trying to help you get through this horrible financial pandemic as well as the health pandemic, but I can only do the financial part. Today, we are bringing back an interview that we had conducted a couple of years back with Chris Gillibo. He wrote the book called Side Hustle. And I thought that this is so important given the current economic conditions under which we are all operating. You know, the Wall Street Journal this week had a, a really a hard hitting dose of reality. And that is that we've had a wave of job losses already, right? We had those with sort of frontline service workers. They say that there's a second wave of job loss hitting some people who thought they were safe. And so corporate lawyers, government workers that are furloughed, state and city budgets squeeze, some even healthcare areas. So in this environment, now more than ever, it is so important to develop a side hustle. And so that's why we are bringing back Chris Gillibo. This is the conclusion of an interview that we actually conducted a couple of years back. Here's more of the side hustle swami, Chris Gillibo. So now you've written a bunch of books. Which yeah, is, but this is the best one, though. It is it? Yeah, I think so. How come? I will say, not that the easiest is the best, but for me, this was the easiest process. Like, I knew exactly what I wanted to do with this book, mm -hmm. and it was just a matter of figuring out how to, how to do it, whereas with some other books, I've had to go through this discovery process and this exploration of, like, how do I take this big message and then distill it, et cetera. This is very practical. You know, this is like step by step, 27 days, do this on day one, do this on day two, et cetera. It's fabulous in that respect, for sure. Um, here's one thing that I circle in red pen. The profit equation. Hmm. Do you know why? why? It's so simple. Mm -hmm. People really, I mean, I'm a numbers person. <laughs> sure. Sometimes people will say to me, like, I can't do this. I'm bad at math. Mm -hmm. For the record, I'm bad at Whatever. math. Whatever. You can't learned, do calculus. Never learned algebra. Never learned algebra, but go on. Okay. But really, this is adding calculus. and subtracting. Yes, exactly. That's, okay. what, that's, that's so, my point. So here it is. I love your, um, the first thing, the secret to turning a profit for any business or venture, whether it's a side hustle, renting out cars, or a multinational corporation boils down to one basic principle. Don't spend more money than you take in. Also with your personal financial life. Mm, Hello, yeah. right? Okay. That's kind of profound, I know. Mm, I love it though. <laughs> Here is your profit equation. Ready, everyone? Expected income minus expected expenses equals projected profit. See, wow. you did not need to go to Harvard Business School yeah. or Wharton. Saved you some money there, $60,000. The book is only 25 bucks. <laughs> it's a good investment as far as I'm concerned. There's just like really easy things about projections. You don't have to be a spreadsheet king or queen. Sure. And that's what I love about this. I just, I so enjoyed the the concept that like, why are we overcomplicating mm -hmm. the the process? Well, I appreciate you saying that. I mean, that's, that's a goal to simplify. You know, I'm not using the word easy. I just want to be clear. Like, I actually think you have to work for something that's important to you. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that everything is easy in life for this process, but it's, it's simple. I've tried to reduce the complexities. I've tried to say, okay, just, if you just do this, then you can get to a basic level of success, which is what I hope people will do. Before we go, two more things. You say you're not a good employee. True. Why do you think that? I'm not a good employee or a good manager. I think, you know, if I go back to those years in West Africa, because there's probably some hyperbole to this, like not a good employee, and I realize that. I, I was actually working with an organization then. You know, I was working for free, but it was for an organization. I can't just do all that stuff myself. I'm not a medical person. I, I loved that job. You know, I loved everything about it. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, I have to just really believe in, in the vision. And if I believed in the vision of the right company or the organization, then I could probably succeed in that environment. But at this point in my life, I've just done, I've just done my own stuff for so long. Like I can't imagine like what's going to happen if I ever stop, you know, writing books and connecting with my audience, which I love to do. But let's say some big company said, you and your yellow sneakers, mm -hmm. you're coming with us. We're going to pay you a pile of money, <laughs> and you're going to basically do side hustle school inside of our organization. And is that something that sounds horrible to you or appealing to you or somewhere in between? I would do it as a visitor. I would go in mm -hmm. and speak to their employees. I would love to do that. Mm -hmm. um, would I do it as an employee? No. Really? No. You wouldn't sell out? Like, what if someone's looking at gobs know, of I, money? I don't know if it's about selling out. I mean, I'm, I no objection to making money, of course. No, 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 but I'm just saying that I if someone put it. a pile of money in front of you and said, well, you got to do this for two years, you got to hang with us for two years if you want all that money. Yeah, I don't know. I, mean, I guess it's like a hypothetical, but my, my response, my initial like gut reaction is no, no. Like, there's, really no there's really no interest in it. It's like, funny. I, love, I really feel fortunate. I feel like I have, for someone who's unemployable and unemployed, more or less, you know, I, I feel like I have the greatest job in the world. I honestly, every day, I'm so excited to, to do what I do. We started the interview 
by asking your best financial decision, which mm-hmm. you said was spending money to travel and see every single 193 countries in the world. Mm-hmm. What's the worst financial decision you've ever made or yeah. career decision? Yeah, great question. I think I actually told this story in, in this book, which I've never told before. When I was, I don't know, 18, 19, 20 or something, there was some you know, ridiculous offer that I heard about, which in retrospect, I realized is like, I don't know, some pyramid scam or something. But at the time, it seemed compelling. And it was just like, if you if you invest some money, if you send us $2,000, then I don't know, you know, you're going to make those gobs of money that you mentioned. And I did it. And I didn't have a lot of, like, I had like maybe $3,000 in my savings account. I spent $2,000, uh, sent it in. Basically, nothing nothing ever happened. Like months went by, and you're supposed to start getting royalty checks. You know, and interestingly enough, at like month three or four, they started sending checks, but they were for like two to three dollars. Or one month it was like six. I think it was basically to kind of make you think something else is coming, which it did. It worked. You know, because like the first two months, I'm like, oh my god, did I waste my money? And then like month three, I get three dollars. I'm like, oh okay, it's going to be okay because eventually all the money's. Anyway, obviously nothing ever happened with that. I felt so bad. I felt so bad over and over, and like finally had to just let that go and say that was a stupid thing. It's not going to control the rest of my life. I just have to, I got to move on and not do that again. Thanks so much to Chris Gillibo for helping us out. And really the the advice he gave uh, a while back stands true right now, holds, holds firm. And we appreciate him spending time with us as always. If you've got a financial question, just send us an email, ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. And always go to the website, jillonmoney.com. You can sign up for our free weekly newsletter right there. Okay, check it out. We'll be right back. You're back. It's Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, we would love to hear from you. Our email address is ask. Jill at jillonmoney.com. And just want to remind you that we have been broadcasting this program from the Policy Genius Virtual Studios. Policy Genius is the easy way to compare and buy insurance. All you have to do is go to policygenius.com. Very easy. Um, Uh, Let's see. Let's just do one more question before we finish up here today. The question is from Dennis. And Dennis writes, his daughter is in her first job after college. I hope she still has this job. She wants to start a Roth IRA. She doesn't have a retirement option. She doesn't have the option at work. Where should she start? Mutual fund? Any sectors to avoid in particular? Dennis. Okay. Dennis, earlier in the show, we had a similar question about this. And what I will tell you is the easiest way to begin is to open up a Roth IRA account for her at some place that offers cheap investing options. So what could that be? That could easily be a place like Vanguard, or it could be a place like T. Rowe Price, or TD Ameritrade, or um, Schwab, or a a robo-advisor like Betterment or Wealthfront, any of those places. She should do this herself. She should also take a risk assessment questionnaire. And, you know, you could help guide her, but this is a wonderful opportunity for you to launch her as a retirement investor. And that's what I'm hoping this does, that you don't, I'm very worried all the time when parents are doing this kind of stuff for their kids. It's one thing to be with them and help them and coach them. But they need to be doing this themselves. You will not be here forever. They need to know what is going on and how to manage their own money. All right? So I hope that you do that. And um, if she needs any help, tell her to follow up with me directly. Got it? She can do that by simply sending me an email. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com, which is what all of you can do. I want to thank you again for listening to the program. I know these are very trying times. We're just hopeful that we can distill the fire hose of information and bring that to you in a way that is understandable. If you have a question, call us, email us, yell at the top of your lungs. We'll be here for you. JillOnMoney.com. We'll check in with you next week. Thanks for listening.